Good morning, everybody. My name is Jill Elwood. Welcome to the February Nonprofit Cafe. This is a program hosted by One Valley Community Foundation, a local organization whose mission is to connect people who care to causes that matter to build a thriving community in Gallatin County. One of the ways we do that is through nonprofit capacity building. So thank you for taking the time to be here today and learn with us. We are so grateful for your time and energy. Um, I do wanna start out by saying that I'm just really thrilled we're doing this session today. I know there are a handful of you, especially in this room, who have been asking for this session for many years. We did a DEI panel in 2020. And since then we've done a couple of other DEI sessions, but we have not yet done a panel um, because it takes extra capacity and time to coordinate. And so this year, when our new program coordinator, Angela, joined the team, we were so thrilled to have the added capacity to be able to coordinate this. So Angela is actually going to take over today. I know you're used to me kind of being the nonprofit cafe uh, coordinator, but she has been uh, setting up this awesome panel. So I'm going to turn it over to Angela and let her take it from here. Got to get my mouse to unmute. Sorry about that. Um, good morning. I am so excited to be here with you guys. So excited that we can do this panel. Um, thank you all for joining us um, for our panel discussion. We've titled this Gallatin Valley's Nonprofit Shaping a Welcoming Future. Um, so I'm really excited to learn and share with you guys this morning. Um, as Jill said, I'll be our facilitator. For the time that we have together, I'll guide us through some brief audience participation activities. Yes, I know we're on a Zoom call, but we're gonna still try to get everyone's voices heard a little bit. Then we'll meet our panelists and we'll dive into our panel discussion. Now we do have a few um, questions prepared for our panelists, um, but we'll be sure to include some time for audience questions as well. Um, let's see, and as we close the day, we'll come back or close the morning, I won't have you all day, I promise. As we close the morning, we'll come back and do a, an end with another brief audience participation. So let's kick things off. Um, I hope you're ready. I'm gonna go ahead and ask you, everyone, grab your phone. Yeah, I know you weren't expecting that, but we're gonna use that for our activity this morning. I do think it's just easiest to do this from your phone. You can do this from your computer, but we are gonna just do a little brief activity and Mentimeter. Typically, Jill kicks us off and kind of asks everyone, like, give us your names, your preferred pronouns, and the organization that you are here with. And so we're just going to do this um, in our Mentimeter. So if you could join us at menti.com, um, you can use this code and I will copy this into, oops, maybe I will, into our chat for you guys as well. If I can find our chat, I will. Everything moves. Here we go. I can do it, Angela, if you'd like me to. <gasps> yeah, I mean, you can. I think I found it. I'm sorry, I'm like now blocking the... Oh, wait, did I just send this to, yeah, to everyone? Look, everyone's watching me do this, it's fine. <laughs> oh, it's because I'm logged in as Jill. I was like, why does that look so weird? So hopefully now you have the chat. Perfect. Thanks, team. Just wanting to see who's kind of with us this morning. Give us a chance to say hello. Hello, Stacy. Hello, Mariah. Katie with GVLT. Hey, Jono. Brittany Ellers with Thrive. Oh my goodness, you guys, so many. Stephanie, Pearl, Wendy, Joe. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. We sure appreciate you being here. Liz Scholl, so nice to see your name in this. Thanks for being here. Awesome. Kelly, I see you in the chat. Thanks for being here. Awesome. I'll give that just one more minute and I've got one more question for us before we dive into those panels um, discussion. Oops. Perfect, perfect, everybody. And we good? I'm gonna move on to our next question. Okay, so curious. Which option best describes the nonprofit that you are connected to this morning? Have you all completed DEI initiatives and seen a change in your organization? You've done some DEI initiatives, but you need and want to do more. 
you're discussing starting some DEI initiative, or you're really still kind of unsure if you should even be doing this work within your organization or what this work would look like. Nice, very cool. Okay. Nice. Okay, so this gives us a sense of kind of who we're engaging with today um, as we're navigating these conversations. It definitely sounds like, and I, I had a feeling this is how this would skew, right? A lot of us have been doing this work. We're at least tipping our toe in it. We're having conversations around it, which makes sense. That's why we're all at the table today to kind of chat and learn from one another. Awesome, I'm gonna go ahead and close that out. Thanks team, I sure appreciate that. All right. Let's go ahead and dive in to our discussion and meet our panelists this morning. So I will introduce each one. I'm going to start with our panelist, Pearl, who is the Director of Operations from Eagle Mount. Um, and I believe you're pinned at the top, but maybe squeeze high, Pearl. Uh, <laughs> um, a little bit about Eagle Mount team. If you're not familiar, Eagle Mount has been operating for more than 40 years and has a staff nearing 30 and is growing. Now, Eagle Mount serves individuals with disabilities of all ages, removing barriers to recreation. So while it can be said that Eagle Mount is no stranger to diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, their formal staff-wide journey really kicked off in 2022 when they hired their first DEIA consultant. So currently, they're working on building a staff-led DEI committee and cultivating DEI-centered discussions with their board. Their DEI goals are strongly centered around accessibility as they're striving to be the best place to work by fulfilling their mission in the most inclusive way possible. Thank you for being here to talk with us about the work that Eagle Mount is doing, Pearl. We really appreciate it. Our next panelist that I'll introduce is Stacy. Stacy is the Vice President of Programs over at Montana Conservation Corps. Montana Conservation Corps has been operating since the late 90s. They have three offices across the state and over 50 full-time staff. Now, if you're not familiar with the work of Montana Conservation Corps, they do run several um, annual programs where they work with young people from all across the country. Since 2014, they've been exploring DEI. Today, they think about their diversity, equity, and inclusion work within three broad umbrellas. They look at this through organizational culture, member service, and community support. Their DEI work is guided by the core inquiry, how do we ensure that all people, most especially BIPOC, Black, um, Indigenous, people of color, and LGBTQIA community members experience safety, belonging, and validation at MCC? Thanks for being with us here today, Stacey. We appreciate it. And lastly, I'm going to introduce um, Mariah. Is, is Mariah here? We good? I'm here. It's Maria. There you are. Okay. Yes. Maria, I'm so sorry, Maria. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Maria is here today. She's the program manager for Thrive. Apologize about that. We did have a little bit of a change up. Thanks for being here, Maria. But Maria is going to talk to us about Thrive, which is an amazing organization that's been serving our community for over, or actually, you know what, Maria, I wasn't sure how long you guys have been here. How long have you guys been here? Yeah, since 1986. Thank so. you. Oh, wow. Okay. Love it. Love it. Okay. Coming up on like 40 years yeah. then. That's amazing. Yeah. A staff of over 20. Yeah. Um, Thrive aims to provide local Gallatin Valley families with the resources, tools, and support they need to raise healthy, successful children. However, they began to notice the services they were offering were no longer meeting our community needs. In response, in August of 2021, they hired their first Spanish-speaking parent liaison position to better serve our expanding Spanish-speaking families. Since that time, their Spanish programming has continued to grow, and they are moving the needle of cultural awareness in our schools and examining and dismantling the barriers our Spanish-speaking families are facing in our community. Thank you for being with us, being here with us today. Um, Maria, we sure appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks team. Let's dive in. So excited to be here. We've got a lot to cover. We're gonna go right into these questions. Um, let's launch it. I'm gonna toss the first one to Pearl. Pearl, could you tell us a little bit about what your first step 
and your diversity, equity, and inclusion accessibility journey was. Essentially, how did you get it all started? Sure. So I think, um, you know, for a lot of nonprofits that are focused on social services, we tend to kind of think we're already doing this. It's our it's our mission. For many of it, it's, a, it's sort of our attitude towards the world. Um, but, you know, and with Eagle Mount, we're so focused on inclusion and access already, um, just with it being part of our mission. But looking at it uh, sort of more seriously and kind of turning that lens inward on the staff, we really, we weren't addressing any of it formally. There was no, um, there was no sort of organized way to address what our values and and policies were that that worked towards these ends. Um, and so, you know, we were certainly trying to be kind and flexible. Uh, we did, we kind of grabbed some of the low hanging fruit going over our job descriptions and advertisements. Um, you know, you does that position really need to be able to lift 50 pounds, right? That's just some of those little bits and pieces that you, that, that are so easy to, to handle once you decide to decide to look for them. Um, but in order to really prioritize DEIA in our in our uh, in our workplace as opposed to just in our mission and how we pursue that, um, we you know we built it right into our strategic plan um, to just make sure that it's an operational priority. Um, and like you mentioned in the intro, we hired an outside consultant. Um, I, I think that that was one of the more important pieces for organization-wide buy-in because we certainly don't have anybody on staff who's an expert in, in this area. We all, we all care. We all want to take care of each other and provide a supportive work environment. Um, but, but we definitely needed somebody to help us work through that process and just um, to some extent do what consultants do and provide that, that air of authority and, um, and have, a, have a touch point for for questions and that kind of thing. Yeah, that's great, Pearl. Thanks for sharing that. And you hit on a few things that I think we'll come back to throughout the rest of the panel. I did hear a little bit about kind of one of the things that I heard, and I think I've heard from all of you guys and discussions I know will come back up is kind of integrating that diversity, equity, inclusion into operations. While you're already doing that kind of through your mission, how do you pull that in into operations and operationalizing it? Um, and I appreciate that you hit on that. I think we'll come back to that. Um, Maria, Stacy, do you want to add anything to kind of your first steps of your DEIA journey within that or within your organization? Um, I can go real quick. Um, and just so you guys know, I am filling in for our Spanish speaking parent liaison, Myra. So she prepared everything and I'm taking some of her notes. So hopefully bear with me. You got this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, kind of the same of just figuring out what our organization stands for and what the needs of the community are and where we fit in and what is our responsibility in this. And this discussion that we've prepared a little bit today is more about our programming, obviously that goes and falls into what our staff does and what our policy is, but we really started with our programming and meeting the needs of our community. I love that. I think that's great. Excellent. Anything else before we move on to our next question? Thanks for that. Maria, I'm going to come back to you and I'm going to ask what was one of your most significant obstacles during your DEIA journey? And that could still be an obstacle today, mm -hmm. but when we're in this space discussing and learning together, we're just curious to hear like what, what were some of the challenges and how did you navigate those? Sure. Um, we have programs in the community and in our schools, and we work with all families. So one of our slogans is any family, any need. And so when looking at, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion in our community, we saw that our Spanish speaking community was growing and wanted to figure out what our place is in supporting the community, especially since a lot of these um, families were coming and being part of our Bozeman public schools. So having those conversations with the Bozeman Public School District and kind of seeing what that means. And so that was a big obstacle in figuring out what, what is happening, what do we need to do? There wasn't a lot of infrastructure and that's still growing. And so really finding out what our place is 
and um, putting in a lot of that work for the strategic planning and not just filling in here and there, but really setting up for the long term. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That makes a lot of sense too. So essentially kind of looking at how your work is being, your your work in the community started to shift because the community started to shift and how can you kind of meet that need? And so that was kind of that first obstacle of like diving into this work, like assessing that community need and then whether or not it's your responsibility to kind of like address, like, and then how do you address? Did, did I get that right? I think you got it perfect. Yay, awesome. <laughs> Pearl, Stacey, anything to add for obstacles in your diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility journey? Yeah, I think one thing comes to mind for Montana Conservation Corps, and, you know, obstacle might not be quite the right word, but I think a significant reframe is that the default sort of way that we think about the purpose of this work can sometimes be outward facing. As an organization that works with uh, AmeriCorps members, I think it started off that DEI was something for the benefit of our participants rather than actually about our own organizational culture and staff experience as if our native or LGBTQ or female colleagues were not experiencing issues of power um, and exclusion or inequity in the workplace. And so I think it takes sort of a constant reflexivity to like turn the mirror back on oneself rather than to continue to think that this is an external initiative for somebody else. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, ex exactly. Like I think, especially in the nonprofit arena, we're so mission focused, right? Like all of our work is connected to this bigger thing, this mission that we're trying to achieve. So when we start to dive into that diversity, equity, and inclusion work, I think a, a lot of folks initially go towards that mission. And that's not that that's wrong, but then how do you also make sure that that's something that you're including internally, which I think comes back to like what Pearl was saying with kind of acknowledging that first step of like, this is this is how Eagle Mount was doing that, was acknowledging that this was something they wanted to do internally and hire a consultant. I don't mean to speak for you, Pearl, is, is that okay? Like, did I, is that? Oh yeah, uh, definitely. And I think that was one of, one of the very first things that we got out of having a consultant involved in our staff conversation was, was um, that she kept redirecting us back to, you know, we're, we're talking about the staff. We're not talking about um, our larger community that we, that we serve. Uh, we're not talking about how we interact with the community at large with regard to our mission. We're talking about this, this workspace. That's our, that's our first step. Um, and that was, I think that is definitely difficult for anybody who's, um, you know, just deeply motivated by the mission that you have chosen to work with. Um, I'd say our other, the other obstacle piece is just time, setting aside time to talk about these specific topics. Um, the goal eventually, of course, is to just incorporate it into what you're doing and just have it be a part of all the work. But the upfront, the upfront time to establish these ideas, make sure that we're all on the same page um, can, can be difficult. I mean, I think every nonprofit is trying to do more than we really have the capacity to do. That's, I think that's just sort of part of the nature of it. It might not be a healthy attitude, but um, I, I, I think that's part of the nonprofit ethos. And um, so as everybody's trying to do a little bit more than they really have time for, then we are adding this other piece, which really is in in support of it. But sometimes taking the time for these conversations uh, is just it's just hard to schedule. It's hard to get everybody in the same room sometimes. Um, and I think that's definitely been one of our one of our obstacles that we're working to overcome. Totally, yeah. I mean, I think about. I think everyone's head is nodding with you when they're like, yeah, all of our nonprofits are already feel like you're working at max capacity. So then to be like, oh, but also add this other initiative to the table that we need you to make time for and to add capacity for. It can feel like a really big hurdle and a big obstacle. Thanks for sharing that. I appreciate that. Um, Stacey, I'm going to pass a question to you here. Can you share with us a lesson learned from your DEIA initiatives? Essentially, kind of, if you had it all to do it again, because you guys have been doing this work as an organization for several years, what would you do differently? What would you change up? You know, I think that we've, we've 
started to do a lot of different things differently over the last <laughs> decade. Um, but when I, and I'm in part, I'm telling a history that predates my time with MCC here, but we initially started off this work by hiring a position to really prioritize on the, our efforts around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think pretty quickly that individual realized that um, that's a lot to shoulder for an entire, like rather sizable organization. And that actually it shouldn't be a single position, but something that is held, uh, the responsibility is distributed across the organization. And that doesn't mean you can't have uh, positions that are focused <laughs> and, and dedicate some of that time to DEI work, but how do you create a sort of collective sense of responsibility has been one of the things that has, I think, shifted from an associate director of DEI to a DEI committee now to actually an org-wide mandate from hiring to onboarding to our performance evals. Um, and sim alongside that, it's kind of shifting away from thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion as a special initiative to something that is central to our mission and sort of the whole of the work that we do. So how do you not kind of bifurcate it, either in terms of the way that you're staffing the, this um, these efforts, as well as the way you're even conceptualizing how they fit with the wider work that you're doing to make sure that it's actually integrated into who you are becoming and, and the way that you operate. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I hear that. I feel like that aligns with so much of the other things kind of that we're hearing with those obstacles and challenges. Um, but having that insight of kind of your the journey at MCC and bringing a little bit of insight of what you guys saw, um, I hope can kind of help um, other folks when they're facing those decisions of like, what can this look like within your organization? Um, Maria Pearl, anything to add with kind of like, what would you do different? What would you change? I like what, excuse me, what Stacy said about it being more than just an initiative, you know, really having it encompass everything you do. And something that we're working on is I think of our board. We have a great board, but we have been wanting some more diversity on our board. And especially with having a new thought is having a program participant, whether they're currently in there or has been part of our programs before. Be on the board, talk to our board members, like give that perspective that we might not have right now. And so I think that helps with just those conversations being more of the everyday. Great, great. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I agree. Pearl, anything to add? Uh, my comments would probably lead into the next question that you have, so. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, <laughs> Pearl, let me toss you a question. Pearl, what impact did your DEIA initiatives have on your board you could also we're also curious to hear like board funders partners essentially we want to spend a little bit of time just kind of talking about how these other pockets of our organization were a part of the journey right we're we've been talking a lot about staff right now but we understand that when we take on this work we want to be including the board our funders our partners and what does that look like um yeah pearl want to talk about that a little bit <laughs> sure um and you know, I think that my just in terms of our formal push into this whole area, um, I feel like we're new enough that I don't necessarily have much to say about um, funders or partner organizations. Um, yeah. But our board has certainly been involved and very supportive of these efforts from from the beginning. Our strategic plan is sort of um, it's a combination of staff and board efforts to to put that together. Uh, and and as I mentioned before, we have it wrapped right into the strategic plan that that there's going to be you know efforts in this area as as part of our efforts to you know be the best um, the best employer that we can be and and do that in support of our mission, of course, which is at the top of it all or the bottom of it all, however you want to look at that. Um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, nonprofits have a bunch of different board structures. Our board is mostly local. Um, and it's definitely a working board. People are actually, you know, helping plan things and work through ideas and that kind of thing. Um, several of our board members are either program participants. Um, they have volunteered with our programs or they're the parent of a participant in our program. And that has, you know, we've, we've always tried to incorporate that. I think we've leaned into it more 
uh, more recently, but it has certainly always been an important piece of of um, of our board structure. Um, but then through through those discussions with our external consultant, as we were looking at all this, um, she really helped us realize that there's sort of three separate processes. One is this staff led initiative that we've been talking about. Um, just that, like, what does the work, what does the workplace DEI initiative look like? And that needs to be staff led. Um, we need to know what staff needs are, and it needs to come from that place. And then a separate initiative that is um, our board's initiative to incorporate DEI into that governing body and make sure that the individuals in that space are, um, you know, are representing the community that we serve and um, and that a variety of voices are able to be heard and, and all the other pieces that come along with, with these things um, just make that that governing body diverse and equitable and inclusive and accessible. Um, and then there's a third effort that is the one that we all kind of want to do first. Um, and that is the piece about, um, you know, what is Eagle Mount's place in this community? Uh, we know that we are a touch point for topics about inclusion and access for people with disabilities. Um, and, and what's our role in the community uh, in terms of education about ableism and topics like that. And that's the piece that's more of a joint effort. That's where the, the staff and board efforts need to meet and um, and just really find our place in the community as part of that, that bigger picture. Um, but without dropping those, those other two pieces about the workspace and you know, the space that the board operates in. Yeah, I, I really love the breakdown of those kind of three areas and how you guys were really able to bring, to acknowledge the importance of bringing in um, your board and how you worked with them to move those initiatives. Because we've talked about this internal piece, right? And, and Stacey, I think you did a great job kind of breaking that down of this like internal piece and this like outward facing thing. And internally, I think so much time we think about like staff. But when we get to that like external facing thing, you do need your board to be on board, <laughs> right? With whatever initiative or messaging that you're saying. So like they have to kind of be a part of this journey to some capacity because they play a, a major role in that outward facing initiatives and like what you're looking like to the community. Um, so I really appreciate that perspective and you sharing that Pearl. Um, Stacey, Maria, anything to add about um, working with funders, partners, um, how were you able to integrate them into the journey? Were there challenges with integrating um, these separate kind of areas into the journey? You guys are so polite. <laughs> I can you never people like on you. In. You're like... <laughs> <laughs> um, Maria, go ahead. Sure, sure. I can share just um I love that you said Pearl of you have participants on your board already um but really for us a lot of it is we have ideas of some program we want to do so is there funding out there talking to those funders who do have some of the same interest and really diving into their idea our idea what can work and um how can we you know ultimately support our mission in the community, but really everybody kind of coming together, putting it out there and then seeing where where people can kind of fit their their role. It's my thing to add. Oh, I like that. I like that. And I, I'm curious, can I follow up and just ask a, a follow up to that? Marie, did you find that you were looking for new funders and new funding opportunities as you started along this journey and those program priorities started to kind of shift? And what was that like? For sure. Um, one example is that we have currently have a Spanish speaking parent educator, which is a brand new position, almost a year. And so we saw the need. We were in the schools working with families, but saw the need in the early childhood, zero to five families coming here with babies and needing that support. So luckily, there was a funder out there who wanted to support this. And so really, yeah, it's putting it out there, seeing what the need was and seeing if there's any way we can help it strategically and not just piecemealing it how we can with some of our staff who can speak Spanish or can, you know, help if a call comes in, but really supporting multiple families. Yeah, thanks for that. Stacy. Yeah, you know, I think that there's kind of two things on my mind in sort of, of like what's in the culture may loo around this. And some of it is even like the acronym of DEI or whatever DEIAB, whatever um, you choose 
but there's actually like we're losing some specificity of what we're talking about and I think sometimes mm -hmm. those terms get thrown around with an assumption that everyone knows what they mean or that we use them to we deploy them to mean the same thing and so on one hand I think um, particularly with a board some concrete specifics around um, what the ultimate outcome, like what is the problem and what's the outcome of the work that you're doing and how is it connected to your mission? We need to tell a better story rather than like speak the language. Um, and at the same time, that language and the specificity of that story is deeply politicized right now and compli complicated in this state, particularly depending on the funders that um, you rely on, even from like a state or federal level. And so I think that, um, the more we can talk about human impact uh, the it, with like concrete language, the better positioned we are to engage with our diverse stakeholders. Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate you adding that and that perspective. And I 100% I agree with you. In fact, on my drive-in was listening to um, an NPR story that was talking about a lot of the same things of, of like, you know, is is DEIA uh, losing momentum um, across the country? And, and is that too decisive? Are people like starting to turn away from that? What does that look like? And um, I think that's in part why like, I really wanted to kind of ask this question for you guys, because um, I know that getting everybody to the table and bought into this can be an obstacle. And I think you're exactly right, Stacey, it, it, how you tell that story really matters, how that narrative is built, how you um, tell that need as to like why we are doing these things and why this is important. Um, so I really appreciate you sharing that. Thank you for that. Anything to add before we move on? Okay. Um, Maria, I'm gonna kick it back to you. How does your organization, oh, this is a great question to follow what we've been talking about actually. Could you tell us a little bit about how your organizational culture differs today from your P, your pre-DEIA initiatives? Like what did you, how has that work transitioned into what you look like today? Like, how are you different? Sure. That was a wordy way to say that, I hope you got that. <laughs> You're not in your head, so I think we're good. <laughs> sure, I'll go, I'll go with what, whatever. Um, you know, our I've worked at Thrive for 15 and a half years now, which is kind of crazy to think, but it is our organizational culture that has kept me there this long. And um, others who might be on this call who either currently work at Thrive or have might be able to say the same thing. Um, so I think that's something that's very important to us, keeping our staff culture alive. We all do hard work when we work with kids and families in the community. So what is something that keeps us alive and keeps us wanting to do our mission? And it's really our staff. And so I would say since kind of incorporating more of the DEIA, you know, information in our work and our organization, we have added just different things, I think, for staff to do and think about and, and read and converse about. Um, an example is our Café Español, which we try to do every month where people who speak Spanish can come and talk and practice and those who are learning can come and talk and practice and those who just want to observe can, can join in too. So that's been one new thing, but I do remember over the years where we've just brought up more books to to read and discuss and um, that go with our work, but not directly. It's just more of that human experience that we really are intentional about bringing to our staff. Great, yeah, I love that. Stacey, what about you? Anything to add on that one? Just kind of, can you speak to the transition? Of, I, know, I know that this work predates your time there, but in the time that you've been at MCC, have you seen that needle move at all? And what does that look like? You know, I'm so curious for my colleagues past and current on the call, how they would answer this question, certainly. Um, but one thing that I think we've brought a lot of intentionality to is just the degree to which we support staff in reflecting on their own social identities, socialization process, social location in terms of experiences of power or marginalization. And we really, I think, have integrated a culture of kind of ongoing reflection and learning um, that, again, is less sort of learning externally about the other, but actually learning to locate oneself inside of 
um, a history and current dynamics that cause harm. Great. Thanks for sharing that. Pearl, I know that you guys are relatively new on this journey, but is there anything that you've seen happen recently, at least journey internally, right? Like within the organization, you guys have been doing inclusive work for a long time, but is there anything that you'd want to share of, of how you've seen your organization change or shift? Sure. Um, I, well, I think a, a couple things that, you know, in terms of a formal journey, we might be pretty new to it, but um, I'd say it's been, I think it's been informally important for a longer time. Um, mm -hmm. I'd say the biggest mm -hmm. thing about the early, about our early changes is just, um, this kind of goes to what Stacey was saying earlier, um, just improving vocabulary, giving people tools to talk about things um, and, and, a, and a focused space to, to discuss these topics, I think has been, um, has already been beneficial. Um, in terms of, uh, I, I would say there are groups of our staff who, you know, often are similar in age. Some of them are friends outside of work, that kind of thing. Um, and so they're going to be talking about these things in very similar ways. And then um, there are some of us who are, uh, you know, a few years older than them and might be tuned in and we care, but it hasn't been this ingrained part of of our lives, the language, I mean, not the ideas, but the language. And so um, it has, it's been a great tool to, um, to have an opportunity to express that even if we haven't been using the exact words that the concepts have already been there. And I think it has, uh, I think it's been a, a good way for us to understand each other better um, in, I'd say partially in a generational way, but just also in a openness to discussion way. That was mm. circular, sorry. No, I think that was great. I think that's a great example of kind of like taking on this work then empowers you to kind of navigate these spaces a little different because you are empowered a little bit more with different language that you're then sharing and right. Did I kind of get that? Is that yeah? It? Yeah. Okay. Just um and I and I think the I think the shared language has given everybody a tool to talk about things that are, you know, both good or things that need improvement. Um and and then also I do think we've managed to um, just I mean I kind of keep bringing up the same things but this this shift from focusing so much on our on our mission and how DIA plays into our mission which is which which is obviously very wrapped up in this in this concept because we are I mean access is is the name of the game for us um, and so just making sure that we're focusing that back in on um on our on our staff base and you know are we keeping the people that we serve out of the out of the staff space um are we building walls there that don't need to be there that kind of thing and just really leaning into those conversations um and often finding that we have been doing the right thing and sometimes finding that it needs improvement and working through that process has been um i think is all steps in the right direction love that thanks for sharing that all right, I do want to open up to audience questions, but before I do that, I was hoping that I could ask you guys one more question um, before we completely open it up. And I really was just curious, we're here today, we've kind of got all these nonprofits across the Gallatin Valley. We're all doing different types of work, which by the way, I love um, the diversity of the work that you guys do as a panel. I think that it's great. Um, we're doing different types of work. We've been in the Valley for different amounts of time. We're serving different folks um, and different programs, but we're really all here on this call today because we all have a connection or a passion for diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. Um, everyone is trying to do this work in some way. We saw that in our poll that like everyone's touching this work in some way within their organization. So I was just curious, knowing that, knowing kind of why we're all here, is there anything particular, any advice, any um, framing that you would like to speak to before we move to audience questions. Um, and I am putting you on the spot with this one. Um, if you need a moment to think about it, that's totally cool. But I was just curious if there was really anything that resonates with you that you wanna get out um, or advice that you wanna share before we open to audience questions. I'm waiting for someone to lean in and then I'll be like, okay, but if you need a minute, 
Maria, how you doing? You feel good? You want to tackle it? <laughs> sure, sure. I can talk. Um, I mean, I think this goes with, with everybody, just of the lines of communication being open in the meetings you have in all staff meetings and really everybody being feeling like they can say what they need to say. And then the leadership listening and then figuring out what that means. So, I mean, I think we all know that communication is the key, but that's really what I think in this whole journey and topic is being open. That's great. Yeah. Stacey, Pearl, anything to add? Anything you want to share? I mean, I, I don't know that I'm one that really believes in advice, but I think that something that has been particularly useful in my work um, and for MCC has, and, and in some ways I've already said this, but to get really clear around where dynamics of identity and power intersect with the work that you already do. And we know that those dynamics happen inside of culture because that's how culture functions. Um, and so some other concrete examples for MCC is that um, our work is based in doing service in, in quote unquote public lands. And we know that those lands are stolen. So there's an indigeneity piece in the education and um, reflection that we do because of our conservation focus. And then we also are really gifted with a, like a, a participants who are 45% um, in the LGBTQIA2 plus identity. And so we need to be really clear around how gender shows up and how sexuality shows up because it's so relevant to so many of the people that we serve. So um, those are MCC's sort of unique places that are hard and sticky and complicated and we are sometimes complicit. Um, and I think that asking yourself as an organization, those questions can be really useful. Oh, that's great. Thanks for sharing that. Love that. Great examples. Pearl, I put you on the spot. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, I think I think I sort of lost track of your of your specific question as I was listening to uh, Maria and Stacy's comments there. Um, but I I think I think the thing that um, that we have sort of leaned into with the most success is just the very initial low-hanging fruit pieces. And I think that anybody can start there. Um, there's just some really easy things to do. Uh, I mean, you can look into, uh, uh, I always I always go back to um, to ableism and, you know, are, it is a job description ableist. Is there any reason why a person in that position, same example I used before, needs to be able to regularly lift and carry 50 pounds? Or is that just in there because it's been in there for 25 years. Um, and so just making sure that the, the way that we're describing positions or the way that we're describing requirements isn't disqualifying people who could probably do the job very well. Um, and and maybe we're preventing people from, from even showing interest who could uh, who could be really lovely. So I think there's some some places to go ahead and and just pick away at the at the low hanging fruit and um, and get a taste for what for what you're trying to do more broadly in your organization. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I think that's I think that's a great uh, kind of takeaway. I think sometimes from my perspective and I think from conversations I've had with folks, um, particularly doing this work in an organization can feel very overwhelming sometimes of kind of where do we start? How do we tackle this? Right. And I I think all of you guys touched on really great things of kind of one, just talking, communicating, keeping those lines open, right? Acknowledging that this isn't going to be easy. We're probably going to make mistakes, but if we can talk about this and keep those lines of communication open, we can kind of address some of these, what might seem more approachable to us at the beginning, these like lower hanging fruit, right, Pearl? And, and that can help to kind of like move the needle. And then CCA I thought you did a great job kind of talking about also really assessing like who are you serving, right? Like what are the spaces that you really need to be mindful of within your organization, understanding that we all look a little different, right? Um, but this work is still applicable to all of us. It's just applicable, maybe a little different, right? And again, that was one of the reasons I loved how this panel worked out, that you guys are all kind of doing different work and serving the community in such a diverse way. Um, but I really appreciate that. Okay, 
you guys didn't come here to hear me talk. I am going to stop talking. <laughs> Let's go ahead and um, open it up for questions for our panelists. And so I think what we can do, Jill's going to help me monitor the chat. So if you want to put a question in the chat, please feel free to. But I would also encourage you, if we've got some brave folks out there that want to take themselves off mute and go ahead and share their question with everyone, um, please feel free to do that. Is it is it Kiva? Am I saying that right? Uh, pretty close. It's Keva. Keva, I saw your hand go up. Keva, you have a yeah. question for our panelists. Ooh. I do. Um, I'm curious to know uh, from from any of you um, what the impetus was for beginning your journey uh, to include DEI in your in your workplace. So was it? I guess what I'm wondering is did did some staff member come up and say, "Hey, we need to do this," or did a board member uh, promulgate it from on high, or? How did how did DEI actually find its way into your organization, and has has the impetus had an impact on the effectiveness of it in your organization? Does it make a difference? Do you think? Great question. Great question. I probably Stacey, had too much coffee, so sorry if that was. <laughs> I can't. I mean. We're so early on in this in this journey. I'm happy to kind of share a couple little things. Um, I, I don't know that I could pinpoint a specific moment or a specific person who who brought this up. I think um, I think we already had conversations about um, specifically being in disability services about ableism and was our staff really reflecting the people that were serving appropriately. Um, and as we worked through that conversation, um, that, you know, the, I think, <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, it was, it was sort of a combination of our own introspection. Our, is our staff reflecting who we're serving was sort of our first point. And then um, leaning into DEI concepts to help us facilitate um, making, a, making a space that is more welcoming to um to a variety of to a variety of folks and making sure that it's not a place where if you don't you know look like me and I'm running the hiring committee you aren't interested in in being a part of this work um and so I think I think that was sort of our our first our first push so um and uh in terms of impact on on our work um I I think it has created a space where folks who um who who would tend to fall into a space where um, these DIA initiatives are going to support them feeling safe and supported in the workplace. Um, I think that just having the conversation and being open to it has encouraged them to feel more comfortable in the workplace, I hope. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, we, we have seen um, an increase in the number of applications for some of our positions. Um, among people who have been participants in our programs before, and I and I love to see that. So, in terms of a, I don't know if that's a, a number that is really terribly helpful for other folks, but for us internally, it feels like okay, we have we have made it clear to people that we are not just here to serve people with disabilities; we're also here to um, to empower people with disabilities, and and kind of turning that corner. So, does that help? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Stacey, Maria, anything to add to that? Hannah, I, I might speak up on behalf of Montana Conservation Corps um, in that we, we kind of started this discussion in 2013 as part of a strategic planning process, and it came down to mission relevance. Our mission states that we're in the business of developing leaders, stewards of the land and engage citizens who improve their communities. And we looked at if, how are we preparing young leaders for the, today's world? And we realized that um, this needed to encompass a much broader constituency of, of, of young people prepared to work in a more diverse world. Um, so then that started the, the conversation for us of 
how do we prepare those young people? And as Stacey reflected, ultimately that turned in, internally in terms of how do we ensure that our community, our culture is one that is uh, inclusive um, and, and, and mindful, so. Thanks for that, John. I appreciate that. That's a great reflection on a starting point too. I think that that applies so well. Maria, I think I saw you were starting to get, you got something for us? I unmuted, yes. Um, well, Kevin, <laughs> <I> think, <laughs> you know a little bit about what Thrive does, but um, like I was saying in that our mission is supporting any family and any need, we have been intentional in doing that, but I, I do honestly think that putting it on our strategic plan and really being intentional. A lot of that happened in 2020 when everything else was happening in the world with the pandemic. And um, maybe we had more time to actually put it down in writing. So that was maybe too recent, but um, it's happening. But I think it's been, it's been constant, but really more intentional in the past few years. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Did we get that covered for you? Any any follow up on that? Nice. Thank you for asking your question. I sure appreciate that. Any other questions from the audience this morning? I have received a few through the chat. I posted in the chat Thanks, that Jim. people could message me directly if they wanted their question to be anonymous. So we have a couple That's anonymous sweet. questions coming in for the group. Uh, the first one I received was, how does an organization go about hiring a DEIA consultant? And do the panelists have any experience with that? Good question. Sure, um, I can share that our um, Eagle Mounts Executive Director was at MCC for a while, uh, quite a while ago. And um, so we found our consultant through MCC and it's a consultant that they have worked with for a little while. So there's a, there's a connection there. I think um, just, you know, if you can reach out to other folks in nonprofit space around here and, and kind of talk about it, there's probably some some resources there um, in the Montana Nonprofit Association is a good resource for finding consultants in certain on certain topics as well. Thank you. It looks like Stacy also just put that information in the chat if anyone is interested in knowing who that is. Stacy, could you speak a little bit about how you how you knew Dynasty because you brought Dynasty to MCC, right? Like, how did yeah, you? I started following Dynasty on Instagram. Um, so okay. social media marketing works. Um, yeah, Dynasty, I mean, she's not the first consultant that MCC has used, and we'd be happy to share our history of other consultants, some local, some specific to the intersection of conservation and identity. Um, but we, Dynasty was running a program that was a year-long program to help organizations who were doing this work sort of address the areas that organizations consistently get stuck. Um, and so we went through her shift accelerator. Um, and it has given us some of that clarity and specificity that I've spoken to today. So huge gratitude to her. Also, I love the plug that social media works. And um, I'm just going to like piggyback off that a little bit and say that if you're not following folks that are doing this work, um, that might be another conversation and, and a resource share that we could share with one another um, to kind of continue to have that conversation. I think filling your socials with um, some of that language and that important work can also be helpful. Uh, <laughs> side plug. Uh, Maria, anything to add to that one? I don't know that you guys have, I'm not familiar with you guys working with a consultant or not working with a consultant. No, so it's great to actually hear some of these ideas for the future. Nice. Very cool. Thanks. I have a question. Oh, sorry, Jill. Where are you going? No, you're good. I have some anonymous ones, but you're brave and you're doing it live. So dive on in. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, it sounds like you guys all have like different levels of representation on your board and staff. Um, so in those situations, how have you guys worked to avoid tokenization and bringing up those conversations of like, are you, you know, willing to be in this role of helping us work through this, or is it not something you're comfortable with? Question. And I saw Jill nodding her head. I feel like maybe this one also came through in the chat. Yeah, good question. <laughs> um, I I think that is that's kind of huge 
for us. Um, one of the big conversations that we have on the regular is um, how to be a good ally. How can we lean into our knowledge of ableism and um, and kind of try and take on some of those questions so that you know um, a coworker who is a chair user or walks with crutches um, doesn't always have to answer those questions. Um, but at the same time, um, we want to make sure that we are facilitating that input, especially when on topics that direct, directly affect somebody who, you know, is a chair user or walks the crutches or has a child with a developmental disability. And so um, we've we've tried really hard to make spaces for those comments or to, um, you know, say we could use some input on the physical access to the space. Would you be interested in that? And I think most of the folks that are involved with our organization in that capacity are willing to be that voice or a voice um, on that on that topic, which is which is really nice. Um, but they also tend to be involved for some other reason. Um, their their professional knowledge is also um, something that supports the work of our board and that and that kind of thing. And so um, they they might come in with that additional lens, but uh, definitely making a fixed effort not to. Not to focus on it exclusively or to provide the opportunity for that feedback without necessarily pointing fingers and demanding it. That's great. Stacey, Maria, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's multiple, there's like paradox and tensions. Um, I love that question, Anna, because um, I think our work sometimes still can be tokenizing to staff, myself included as a professional gay, right? Um, and at the same time, I think it's about um, offering choice. So with staff in particular, I always make it really clear, like your involvement would be welcome and it's not at all expected. Offering compensation. So at times, you know, staff say thanks and no thanks. Um, and then we hire externally um, to have that representation, compensate it um, and sort of not demand it of someone because of the identity that they hold, but because of the area of expertise or deep knowledge that they've cultivated as a result of that lived experience. Um, and, and then we also lean heavily on affinity spaces. So both for our participants and our staff, we create spaces for shared or similar identities. Um, folks to convene in a separate space that gives you a little bit more breathing room for people to do their own work, but kind of not on the behalf of those um, that kind of emotional labor of others. I would love to add I, one thing again on behalf of Stacy and MCC, having worked under Stacy um, in this work. Um, and that is that not only as a queer Indigenous person, not only did Stacy always be extremely explicit that there was a choice, but she would also add a really important second step, which was to say, this work is not hinging on you. We would love to have you there, but the work's going to happen even if you don't choose to be in this space. So there wasn't this pressure of, well, I know it's a choice, but if I'm not there, what's gonna happen, right? Um, now, unfortunately I have to hop up early, but I just want to make that plug because Stacy, I wasn't sure if that was something that you recognized was quite so impactful. Thank you all for this time. Thanks, Stephanie, it's good to see you. Maria, anything to add on that, on your guys' experience of kind of navigating um, um, space really, for voices? Yeah, I think that's the, the thing, the, the space and checking in with everybody and even um, asking Myra to be on this call. She doesn't have to represent um, our Spanish speaking community all the time. Um, so really asking her, does this feel like something you want to do? And um, I have a perspective that's she and I are similar, but different, um, you know, being that I was born in this country and raised here and she was not. So just really taking these different perspectives, being aware, like Stacy was saying, and, and um, just really having that space to people to say, yes, no, this is comfortable, this isn't, um, and creating that within the staff and culture. And it's a, it's a process for sure. But I think we all have to be self-aware, but also aware of those around us. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you all for sharing that. That was a really good question. Um, I'm very happy that that one got asked and 
Sounds like Jill also had that one in the chat. So other people wanted that one as well. Um, any other questions, Jill? Did you have another one from the chat? Does anyone else want to be brave, speak up? I get it. It's virtual. It's hard. <laughs> I do have more, but I want to give the audience just a second to be brave and dive in if they would like. <laughs> I have a quick question. Um, how often are you all reassessing your DEI policy? Ooh, that's a good one, Liz. Thanks for asking that. So how often are you guys reassessing and replanning? Constantly, because we're still building it in terms of it being formal. <laughs> <laughs> does that, what does that look like for you guys, Pearl? Are you like formally reassessing this? Uh, it, it's a lot of different pieces. It, it's not, um, there's not a single written policy yet. We're building, um, we're building a staff committee and, um, you know, we have several meetings set up over the course of 12 months with, um, with Dynasty, who Stacy shared her name. Um, and, you know, as we, as we work through this, we're looking at how it applies to, um, sort of all of our policies. Uh, so it's not necessarily having a single separate policy, but how does our uh, our employee handbook and our, you know, our hiring guidelines and all of those things, how how do those work into these into these ideas? So it's not it's not a standalone thing. It's it's taking these ideas and values and applying them across all of the things that we do. Um, and then making sure that when we're when anytime we need to create a new piece for any of those that we are continuing to apply these values as we you know generate new policies and that kind of thing. Great. Stacy, I'm gonna toss oh go oh. ahead. Oh no, uh, I don't know. <laughs> no, please do, please do. I was trying to like Okay, how do I toss? Who do I toss to? Please share. Please do. Okay. <laughs> I was just going to say um, our intention is that we we have weekly staff meetings um, or for our management team and then monthly all staff meetings. And then in our management slash leadership team, our goal is to go over our strategic plan, our operational plan every quarter. And then our overall plan, like every year. So some might say we have a lot of meetings, but um, I think it really keeps us on track. If you one week, you have a plan to do this, but something else takes over then to carry it on for the next. So again, it's that intentionality of keeping it in the forefront. We yeah. do a pretty meeting heavy, Maria. Um, so, you know, in terms of how, let's see. We, I think in phases, we have audited different components of our organization. And so we've reevaluated our benefits package and employee handbook through a lens of identity and equity. Um, and then we moved to our program curriculum. And we actually had a series of questions for our cultural audit of whose perspective is this sort of written from, whose voice is missing from that narrative. Um, and then re rewrote from there. So I think in terms of kind of written practices, we've had these phase audits to better incorporate this work. Um, and then in terms of kind of organizing our work, our committee meets monthly. There's three subcommittees within our committee that meet probably every other month. And on an annual basis, we have new goals that really are leading us towards these kind of wider efforts that are woven into our strategic plan. Excellent. Great question, Liz. Thanks, um, everyone, for sharing. That was a good one. You guys are great at these questions. I should have, I don't, I should have just like opened it to you guys and just, we could have just had a big conversation awkwardly over Zoom with you guys just asking the panelists a bunch of questions. <laughs> Such good questions. Sorry, Jill, do we have another, or wait, I'm sorry, does anyone else want to be brave and speak up? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll speak up because I, I've been thinking lately about, uh, DEI, particularly equity and representation within the, the board of directors governance model and questioning whether what we ask and expect from our board members is in fact um, a reflection of classism, uh, whiteness, uh, all, all kinds of things that are uh, antithetical to our objectives in DEI. And I think I, I speak because We've had a very difficult time retaining indigenous 
members on our board of directors uh, who have all left within their first term, very happy with the work that MCC is doing, but not feeling like it was a place where they could make a significant difference to benefit their community. Uh, and so it's really made me question kind of the role of governance boards and how we are incorporating the principles of equity and inclusion uh, and diversity within this model that we've absorbed. And so I'm, I'm wrestling with, with different models of how do we uh, provide voice uh, to underrepresented uh, people within the governance of our organization versus our programmatic staff-led efforts. I'd be interested if the panelists have some ideas. A great question. I really appreciate that one. And we talked a little bit about engaging the board, but we really didn't. And I know Pearl, you shared that you're you do have some um, lived experience on your board. Um, so I wonder. I'm not to throw you under, not to like sure. put you in the spotlight, we, but maybe <laughs> we do. I think. Um, I think one of the things to consider here is that in terms of a minority group, people with disabilities have a fundamental difference in that there is no there's no consistency in terms of um, the culture that they may have been born into or or pieces like that. Um, and so there's not um, I, I think we have people who, who have a lived experience of having a disability, having a child with a disability, um, volunteering for years with our programs, that kind of thing, who don't necessarily um, experience that power dynamic in the same way. Um, so, so I think there's just a little bit, I just think we need to acknowledge the difference there. Um, I also think that the, the mission that we have um, is, that there are changes that can absolutely be made um, by folks on our board with a disability. And so um, I, I think we're just, you know, coming at it from a little bit of a, a different perspective. And um, that lived experience is, is such a good match for our governing board. So um, I don't know. I don't know how helpful that is, but that's that's our experience anyway. Maria, anything to add? I don't think we've spent much time talking about the board over at Thrive really yet. Yeah, um, I think this this is actually a really good thoughtful question. It makes just um, brings up more questions for me of just of the people that maybe you have had on your board that didn't last or didn't stay longer, um, and they love the work. But what I guess what was the thing that drew them away is I guess my first question and um you know our board is definitely a lot of a fundraising board and so I think a lot of what we do might be a different focus of what kind of what you're saying although it is a strategic plan of ours to have more diversity on our board um but how do we go about that I think is the big question too and that's probably part of your question and and sustaining that and um, I don't have a real answer, but it definitely is something that makes you think of what is the right approach um, and to get the right people in the room who, who want to be there and can and feel valued. Yeah. Casey, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, John and I are in an ongoing conversation about this, but I, <laughs> you know, I do think that um, it's really easy to inherit what we've seen and known of how boards operate. And actually like there might be a wide range in choice of even how a meeting is run. So I'm a part of a board that recently realized like, oh, Robert's rules are not in our bylaws. Like why in the world are we communicating in this way? And that's a like very small example of I think a multitude of ways that culture sort of permeates how we think about what it means to organize, to come together, how we present what the role is. And so can we create differentiated avenues of contribution that are not exclusively financial, but might be about cultural knowledge, for example, um, and then really be rooted in relationships so that people can make that connection between their service um, and, and their time spent with the board. Ah, thanks for that. I just wanna, I just wanna open, and Jill, I'm sorry, I know we have questions. 
I just in the spirit of collaboration and that we're all here part of this conversation, I'm just curious to open it up to the audience. Does anyone from the audience have anything that they want to share with with their board structures? Something that they've seen successful, um, something new or different that they're doing and how they are building and kind of navigating that governing board space. I actually have a comment not to on this particular topic before, you know, not just sharing other questions, but um, <laughs> Jono, I have struggled with this as well. The board structure in general, I think is classist in so many ways, especially when it comes to the expectations that foundations and philanthropists and funders put on us that all board members are expected to contribute. Um, I know I'm not the only one who has seen a grant application that has said, do all of your board members contribute financially every year? Um, and I was previously with another nonprofit where we intentionally had folks from very different um, socioeconomic statuses as part of our board, because those were the families we served and we wanted them represented. And ultimately we had to say like, okay, these aren't our funders. If this is a requirement for these foundations, if this is a requirement for these corporate grants, then we are gonna take an abundance mindset and say we will find funding elsewhere because like our values are more important to us than being eligible for this funding. But that is hard to do. It is hard to do when it is tied to funding. It is hard to do when it is tied to um, just your ability to, to raise money for your mission, which you care about. And it's like this kind of, is it a necessary evil? Is it not? Can we say no to this? Um, but I, I, I totally agree that this is something that the nonprofit sector as a whole really needs to grapple with. Um, but yeah, I'd be curious to hear from other folks in the audience as well if, if they have made any tough decisions surrounding their priorities here. What do you think, Angela? You want another question while folks simmer on this? Yeah, thanks, Jill. Let's do um, one more question. We'll start to kind of like, I want to be respectful. We we have till till like 10.30, right? 10.30. We have 15 more minutes. We're doing great. We're going to do like a little wrap up because, you know, I love a debrief. Um, yeah, let's do another question. Or if anyone else wants to speak up to, um, again, I know it's it's hard. We sure appreciate hearing voices. It's always nice to like hear a voice in a piece. But Jill, I feel like we haven't let you share one in a while. Maybe we should go right to you. People have been giving them to you. <laughs> I can throw one in from the chat. Uh, the most recent question we got was, for orgs that work with a wide political spectrum, how do you navigate the language and wording DEI? Bring people along that journey with you. You guys have such thoughtful, beautiful questions, and I just love this. Um, well, that is, yeah, that's a big question. As I'm looking at some of the organizations that I see here, um, I know that, I know that a lot of us are, are struggling with this. What is, what is our moment to, to, you know, share, uh, to, to share these things and how do we talk about it in a way that, um, that explains to people that it's about, you know, making this inclusive space and that it's not about, um, that it's just, it's just not politicized for us. It's, it really is about, it really is about kindness and it's not about suggesting any kind of specific affiliation. Um, and, and that's, I, I mean, that's just sort of naming the question that we have, um, not giving an answer because we don't have one yet. Um, but it's certainly something that comes up with us quite frequently um, as we, you know, as we navigate this space, um, disability services knows no political party. Uh, and, and so that's, it's just, it's a whole topic that, that we've definitely been grappling with, not necessarily um, in great detail at the moment, as we are currently so focused in, but, you know, as we prepare to share what we've been doing with our constituents, how do we how do we do that in, in a thoughtful way that helps people understand what it really means for us um, is a is a big question. To dig into some like juiciness, I sort of have an allergy to claims to apoliticality in this conversation. 
And so, the, and this is really complicated because I believe in dialogue and I believe in everyone's inherent humanity and I want to keep people at the table. And yet my identity has been politicized. Um, and is increasingly so, and that is even more so for people in different bodies than mine. And so I think that there's um, a tension that can't be reconciled, particularly in this political moment, that um, it, the, that, you know, I guess I join uh, bell hooks and other black feminist thinkers before me that like the personal is political. And so how do we keep the relationship personal um, while not denying uh, the real power kind of stakes um, on the line? And it, yeah, it feels risky to say that. It feels like I'm like maybe living in the wrong state to say it, right? Um, but it, it's also a truth that I think we can't skirt away from um, that is, is, is really messy and might also cost us funders, to your point, Jill, of who we decide to partner with and, and how we go about this. Um, thank you for putting such great words to that, Stacey. I appreciate that. Yeah, that was great. That was wonderful. Maria, anything to add on that? I mean, not really. I think Stacey hit it. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, the one thing I think for Thrive, at least in my experience, is when it comes to protecting kids and families, all kids and all families, we sometimes struggle with what that means in our role in policy and and policy change and going to Helena or talking to you know whoever and um, that can be kind of scary. Can it's because it, like you said, it's putting yourself out there and and um, trying to see what what does that mean. We're trying to protect our the people we serve, but we want to also represent our organization well and. Um, so it's just, this is, I guess, not a concrete answer, but really being thoughtful of the things that were brought up. And and I, I agree, like we we have a responsibility. We have a, a chance to use our voice. So let's do it um, and do it in the right way because we are, I, I mean, we wanna protect these kids and families. So um, it's hard though to put yourself out there. Maria, I'm glad you mentioned like the actual legislative question because we I talked earlier about like, is it DIA, which A are you talking about? Do you have B? There's also like a J there, right? And we actually used to describe our work as Jedi and have decided that justice is actually beyond the scope of how MCC takes this up, that we're not agitating for political change. We're equipping leaders who understand the political ramifications of how they move through the world. And so we did actually define some lines, some of which are, are mandated by our grants that we're not going, that, that are not partnerships we're walking away from. You know, AmeriCorps has like clearly prohibited and um, activities that include um, lobbying, right? Or actually just like any sort of legislative um, activity. I don't know why I'm losing my words right now. So, so, while the personal is political, there's also like specific political activities that may or may not be within the scope of how your organization is pursuing DEI work. Mm -hmm. That's a really great point. I appreciate you sharing that. I think we maybe have time for one more because I wanna reserve just a little bit of time at the end. Does anyone wanna speak up? Jill, do you have any more in the chat? Um, I just saw something pop in the chat and I'm trying to see if it's a comment or a question. It looks like a comment. Um, you want to dive in? I, I saw. Nope. Yeah. Can I have I a question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and fire <Empire> away. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was wondering from these panelists, and maybe I missed this, so I apologize um, if this was already talked about, but I'm curious if you could each talk specifically about um, who on the staff participates in, like, there's been a lot of discussion, like, it's been really good to create space for these discussions, but 
in particular, like I know MCC, I know all three of you have a lot more staff than like, I don't imagine these are happening at every staff meeting. So I would love to hear specifically who's involved in the, like, who's setting prioritize and priorities and like working on this. And then how do you communicate that out to broader groups so that you don't, you know, cause if you have say a focus group working on these topics, then you're like, like have this risk of having that group really diving in and benefiting, but then you're not bringing along like the rest of the org and then there's staff turnover. Um, could, is there time to speak to that? I think so. Yeah. We've, we've got a few minutes left. Yeah. Thanks for that question. And so essentially help me out. Did I get this right? Like essentially wondering like who is leading these conversations within your organization and how do you make sure that that conversation is integrated throughout the organization so that it doesn't get like kind of siloed out to the side to get that. Yeah. I can speak, um, I'll try and be quick for our other panelists. Um, so we have a committee of 10 and those are our like most enthusiastic champions of this work. And I view that from an organizational change perspective as a good thing because having ambassadors integrated across positions gets you to that tipping point where there's actually like no other option, it's just the culture. And I think we're there. Um, but we also have our staff divided into learning groups that meet quarterly and the group changes every year, but to do some internal work and reflection and dialogue around identity, equity, and power. Um, so that's sort of how one of the ways that we've tried to distribute it, as well as just viewing both training and practices as everybody's responsibility. And, and I'll add to Stacey's comments. I think leadership from the top is important, even if I'm not on the committee, that I clearly specifically support the work of the committee, advocate for it. I think that's important. And I think it's important, too, that our boards be bought in not just yeah yeah we support what you're doing but they have this conversation among themselves too i'll give a short answer um i agree a leadership for sure and we have those of us who manage teams have at least monthly supervision with the people that we manage and so taking that time to listen to things that they're bringing that up bringing that back to our management and leadership team. And then we do have like our executive director who would be our our first contact with, between the board. And so just taking all the levels and really listening to whether people are bringing up concerns or ways to incorporate new policies or DEIA work and listening and bringing that to the appropriate channels is my short answer. Um, we have had several staff-wide conversations. We have monthly staff meetings, uh, and it's not always necessarily the, the focal topic, um, but we certainly have been trying to make sure that we take the, the values that we've established and apply them to the other conversations that has been the subject of several of those, um, as well as having a couple of um, staff retreats where the, the entire staff is off-site for a couple of days in a row. Um, and, you know, most recently it was facilitated by dynasty, uh, once again, the consultant that Stacy shared, and um, and we anticipate doing that again this spring. Um, and then the the plan for the committee is for it to have, you know, one person on it who's a member of our management team, but then make sure that we've got voices from all the different pieces of the organization, you know, folks that are involved in our direct program services, folks that are involved in fundraising, just make sure that you know, there's there's pieces from all over the organization that are involved in the in the committee that meets a little more often. You guys, this is awesome. You're all amazing. Thank you so very much for your time and for having this conversation with us. Um, I am going to turn it back over to Jill in just a moment, but I do just want to take a minute, and this is a little biased for myself, so I just want to name that. Um, I want to take a moment to just quietly reflect and process 
because we talked about and shared so much today. And I want to make sure that we can walk away with something that we're going to hold on to, something that we're going to marinate on, something that we're going to put into action, food for thought, whatever that is. So I just want to take just a moment. I was going to switch this back over to Mentimeter, but I don't think we need to do that. Let's just take a moment find a quiet moment, maybe jot something down. And if you feel like it, which sure love it, if you would share um, your takeaway in the chat, it could be a simple one word. Um, I just wanna, I'm gonna stop talking so that we just have a minute to kind of like process and take it in. There was a lot discussed this morning um, and I wanna make sure we can hold on to something. So one minute, be quiet. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to bring us back. That might have been a little short for a minute, but I do want to make sure that I can try to give Jill some time um, so that she'll maybe let me do this again someday. Uh, <laughs> um, I do want to just say thank you so much to our panelists. Just give you guys a big round of applause, give you some love. We really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for letting us um, explore this um, information um, and this uh, topic. Jill, with that, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Huge thank you to Angela for facilitating this and our three panelists, Pearl, Stacy, and Maria. Thank you for your time. Our nonprofit cafe speakers and panelists volunteer their time to be here. So thank you for taking the time to volunteer and share your expertise with our local nonprofits. A big thank you as well to our sponsor, First Security Bank, for keeping this program free for our local nonprofits. I do want to mention that I'm going to send a follow up email with a quick survey so we can continue to learn what you all want to learn about. But I will also, so many awesome resources and consultants and social media channels came up today. So I'm going to do my best to put as many of those as I can in our follow-up email. So that will come out later today. Um, but thank you for taking the time to learn with us. We always appreciate getting to learn alongside you. I hope you all have a beautiful day and we will see you at our next program. Thank you for being here.